So, I was watching a short here on YouTube, which featured a compilation of Mark Hamill talking about a particular line from Star Wars A New Hope, the first film in the series, which had perturbed him so much to the point of eventually pleading with George Lucas, the director, to remove this said dialogue from the film. It so happened that this line was eventually removed from the final cut of the film after Hamill's hard insistence. Thus, I thought I would make a short video on this particular topic, so let's not waste any time and just play the clips that you can get a feel for for what I'm talking about in regards to the line. And Harrison says, look, kid, I've uh, done my part of the bargain. When I get to an asteroid, you, the old man, and the droids get dropped off. And my line was... But we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquila or Solus. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large scale assault. What piqued my interest from this clip is twofold. Number one, I am interested in why Mark Hamill, aka the immortal Luke Skywalker, was so perturbed by this particular line of dialogue. Like, I mean, of all the lines in Star Wars, often involving exotic, creative sci fi elements, what made this particular line so special? so much so that the actor had to interfere with Lucas directly. And number two, the dialogue itself, which I had some immediate reflections about in terms of its content. For the first point, we can directly relay what Mark himself thought about the line, as is explained in the short which I will post in the description, namely his impression that the line of the film was of a particularly awkward nature in relation to what a quote-unquote normal person would ever say in a real setting. This strikes me as odd for a number of reasons. First of all, Star Wars is in itself a huge encapsulating space opera, and it is not in any shape or form particularly concerned with realism in relation to its dialogue. After all, we are not exactly talking about the realist films of, let's say, Rossellini's War Trilogy, where Star Wars is obviously in an entirely different category. I mean most strikingly here because it employs such strong elements of entertainment compared to the other films. If anything, in relation to Star Wars dialogue, there is, number one, an overt use of soap drama elements such as involving a high degree of melodramatic overtones, number two, a reliance on an episodic form of storytelling, and lastly, number three, over-the-top narrative arcs often involving a high degree of tension as well as dramatic surprises. For the first point, Star Wars, if anything, has always been categorized as an epic, which on the superficial visual level makes immediate sense, following from its size and grandeur, all brought together by a science fiction galore of special effects and other technical gadgetry, a real upgrade in terms of effects than, let's say, earlier sci-fi films from the 50s such as The Forbidden Planet. Although for my taste, Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey from the late 60s still takes the number one spot for me in terms of technical achievement. Anyways, in addition to the grandeur of the film, there is also a heavy use of a traditionally heroic characters who are brought onto the screen, most famously seen by Luke Skywalker, the main protagonist, who serves as the hero archetype in the film, taking us from humble beginnings as a farm boy on Tatooine to a transformed mature Jedi Knight in the third installation of the series along with other larger-than-life personas such as Yoda and even a princess in the form of Princess Leia. A host of characters, in other words, where counterparts are easily found in other epics and fantasy adaptations in terms of universal archetypical content. In addition to this, there exists a complex layering of symbolic imagery as the alluring lightsabers which can be tied with honor, duty, and even more personalized attributes depending on the color of the given light set, as well as the force itself which serves the role in many ways of spirituality, where one may for instance make comparisons with the Tao and Taoism, or other spiritual elements seen in the religion of pantheism as an example. The heavy use of mythology and archetypes is a fact which ties directly in with Lucas himself, who admitted to taking much inspiration from the mythology genre citing his appraisal of Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces in particular, a work which explores comparative mythology, where there is a heavy insistence on a general mythological structure of the journey of the archetypical hero found in myths from around the world, 
there is a rather interesting interview series you can watch here on YouTube as well, which I have a link in the description, where Campbell talks with Bill Moyers. It should also be noted that Campbell's work has often been criticized for generalizing too much in terms of making comparative assessments in terms of different mythology, but he was certainly a pioneer in the field of mythology. But the second part, one could say then that in terms of episodic form, one could easily imagine tense cuts being made into the film directly, which would complement a serialized form of TV episodes, as well as the fact that there exists an intrinsic narrative complexity where a rich tapestry of multiple storylines are employed, as well as involving a highly detailed lore, not just detailing backstories, but also giving rise to an expanded universe, world-building construct, rich with its own mythology. The richness of this construct is immediate, calling for all the countless adaptations that have been made in the Star Wars universe, from series to books to other fan memorabilia, in this sense, it would therefore not be unusual to deconstruct Star Wars in episodic form, where one may, in an uncontroversial manner, exemplify the major plot points, key themes, as well as stylistic elements belonging to each film in the sequel series of Star Wars. However, I claim that even within each of the individual films, one may do the same, much in the same way one may, for instance, break apart each individual book in the New Testament of the Bible in order to more attentively observe a common thematic focus within each storyline slash scene, as well as getting a better grasp of the fulfillment of prophecy, which in the case for Star Wars involves the strong duality seen between good and evil, where Luke Skywalker's role in the spiritual separation is explored in full detail. Treating each storyline within a given film in terms of reflecting on its conclusions, as well as further interpretations, may thus be a very fruitful engagement, and is part of what makes the first Star Wars trilogy so alluring as pertaining to its rich mythological abundance of content. Finally, in reference to the third point, and the last point, the narrative scene in Star Wars is a product most of all of using epic classical traditions where one could here easily make the parallel, let's say, between the ancient Greek epic of Homer's Iliad having its own dramatic backdrop of the Trojan War, which here in the case of Star Wars has been replaced with an intergalactic space battle between the Rebels and the Empire. In other words, we here move from the localized sphere to the galactic sphere, where one is far less limited in terms of imagination. By the way, the next video I will put out will be on the ancient Greeks, so stay tuned for more epic history if it's something of interest to you. Getting back to the epic narrative of Star Wars, we also see more infusings, so to speak, with the deep, shocking moral complexities explored in Star Wars, such as the blood relation between Darth Vader and Skywalker, where the moral complexities are made deeper in some sense by also alluding to themes such as prophecy and fate. This all makes for what is perceived by audiences as over-the-top narrative arts. To conclude this paragraph then, we may then say that Star Wars takes the role of an expansionist myth construction in its story portrayal, where yes, the film plays to very much universal themes, but it can also be seen as one of the few American epics where the format is simply changed from that of book form to the celluloid medium. One may even state that there is a stronger form of unification between the traditionally industrial north of America and the agrarian south, whereas Moby Dick plays to northern sensibilities and Tom Sawyer, for instance, plays to the opposite. Star Wars, on the other hand, unifies the whole of the American landscape in one great mythical set composed of many subsets. Okay, to sum up then, I know I went on a little tangent there, but the key here is to argue in favor of how a, for lack of a better term, soap opera inspired screenplay, as in the case of Star Wars, plays in favorable terms when it comes to the execution of the film as a whole. I know this phrasing may have negative connotations for me, but it is certainly possible to have a script seeped in melodramatic content yet have actors who execute the material in an authentic, non-superficial way, as opposed to serialized TV soap opera productions 
for large superficial expressive maneuvers along with over-the-top acting quickly become the norm. Thus, I think what Mark Hamill is reflecting upon in relation to the line he did not want included has less to do with exactitude or realism in relation to how people talk and more to do with the incongruence in relation to the melodramatic infused screenplay which takes strong inspiration among others from soap opera dialogue and makes its way naturally into the Star Wars universe as we see in the first trilogy in particular. In short, the line is more of something you would hear in other stereotypical science fiction franchises such as Star Trek, which brings us to the second point I want to comment upon, namely the line itself, content. So let's have a look at the line again. Harrison says, Look, kid, I've done my part of the bargain. When I get to an asteroid, you, the old man, and the droids get dropped off. Mark Hamill, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquile or Solus, and what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. Clearly, if one is not accustomed to the format of science fiction, then the line might seem a bit contrived or cumbersome to say the least. It actually points out a criticism many people have in terms of science fiction writing, where people complain about making conventional narrative setups unbearingly complicated and too saturated with convoluted technical details. The comparison here would be something, I guess, like having two narrative characters engaging in dialogue while playing what seems to be chess, only on further inspection the game is revealed to be a game of quantum chess, where the compulsory nature for the explanation of the game that naturally arises takes attention away both from the narrative development of the story as well as the actual dialogue itself. In any case, Hamill is certainly wrong in the case that he means to say that the line is inappropriate in the context of science fiction, but is on the other hand keenly correct in the case of it not fitting particularly well within the Star Wars universe. A universe that takes more inspiration, I think, from the realm of an epic fantasy adaptation than that of science fiction. The influences of an epic have been touched upon earlier in the video, but I will reiterate that the character assortment found in Star Wars could be taken right out of epics or other fantasy sources, for each main character carries a universal archetype and serve in many ways as cultural icons, having had what I claim is uncontroversially a deep cultural penetration in culture. There exists therefore, as I claim, more fantasy elements than that of science fiction elements, although the latter exists of course as well. We could say that the line reference thus has its home in more typified science fiction adaptations, where Star Trek would serve, for instance, as a prime example. Here, as we are placed in a future of rational idealism in many ways, catering to cerebral idealizations, much inspired by the Age of Enlightenment, for instance, where it is thought that Homo sapiens have evolved past more primal, egotistically driven competitive enterprises, which it earlier took part in, it then comes as no surprise that rationalist explanations often lean on the long-winded format, which again takes precedence, along with other technical jargon, conjured up in particular from engineering aboard the enterprise. The leaning in on more soap opera-inspired dialogue and features has also been more stripped away with here, although of course there are exceptions. The awful romance scene between Kai Wynn and Dukat in Star Trek Deep Space Nine serves as a key example here for instance. Who wanted to watch that? Oh boy was it painful to get through. Luckily the last portion of episode seen in season 7 are very good to compensate. Lastly, a very important distinction where I might as well refer to as one of the key distinctions between shows like Star Trek and Star Wars, where congrats if you made it this far in the video, is that the former serves as dynamically evolving, while the latter is clearly conservative, meaning ships need to be altered as well as evolve along with other technology, and even social structures may evolve deeply over time in classical science fiction. In short, it is not just 
that one is striving along with technology, but one assumes that the very bit of technology will look vastly different within just a short relative period. This is contrasted in Star Wars, where we always see the same familiar technology almost, more or less, and the emphasis is much more towards conserving present states and establishing harmony, as is also seen in the format of fantasy. So, Star Wars is certainly not in the category of part of science fiction. But this is a big topic which I surely will return to in later full analysis of the first two Star Wars film I intend to cover, so I will leave you there. I hope you found this video interesting, where I gain my thoughts on the line removed from the first Star Wars film. As always, please like, share, subscribe, and all that other good stuff, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers!